So tonight, I am suspending my campaign. Jeb Bush calls it a day after a disastrous showing in South Carolina. His nemesis, Donald Trump, was the easy winner. We'll have a live report. There is no justification for President Obama to uh, make a visit to Cuba. Miami Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton blessed the president for going to Cuba, but other Cuban Americans approve the congresswoman is with us live. As Justice Antonin Scalia's journey ends, the controversy over a successor is just beginning. We will take it to the round table. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you could join us. The president will be going to Cuba. No surprise there, really. And we're going to talk about it in a minute with Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton. First, though, the news of the day, the results from the Republican primary in South Carolina. The polls said for weeks Donald Trump was going to be the winner, and he was, although not quite by the margin that he had hoped for. Marco Rubio narrowly edged out Ted Cruz for second place. Jeb Bush was fourth, a death knell for his campaign. John Kasich was fifth. His campaign is barely alive. Our friend and co-moderator of this program, our colleague Glenna Moberg, is live for us this morning in Columbia, South Carolina. Glenna, good morning. Great to see you. Give us your readout about what happened in the primary. Oh, wow, Michael. It feels sometimes like we're kind of in this alternative universe. You have this millionaire from Manhattan who just took the South and its first primary. And then you have somebody who, at his expense, the field is whittled down to a lot of people's surprise, Jeb Bush bowing out before the Florida primary. So kind of right now, up is down and down is up. He had South Carolina's numbers all along, even at long odds. There's nothing easy about running for president, I can tell you. It's tough, it's nasty, it's mean, it's vicious. It's beautiful. <laughs> when you win, it's beautiful. Donald Trump's double-digit win was so decisive, it was called with just 3% of precincts reporting, even after a week taking on the Pope, the legacy of George W. Bush, and questions about Trump's conservatism. The battle for second played long into the night. Florida Senator Marco Rubio overcame the debate debacle of New Hampshire, buoyed by a rainbow coalition of state endorsements and late deciding voters who found him the most electable. For me, the state of South Carolina will always be the place of new beginnings and fresh starts. South Carolina was Senator Ted Cruz's to lose. He was counting on the three-fourths of voters here who identify as evangelicals, but lost a significant number to Trump, likely a jobs and economy vote over faith-based issues. The screaming you hear now from across the Potomac is the Washington cartel in full terror that the conservative grassroots are rising up. And as his fourth place numbers remained in single digits, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush suspended his campaign in a dignified emotional speech with a final shot at Trump. I firmly believe the American people must entrust this office to someone who understands that whoever holds it is a servant not the master. To the first caucus in the West, Hillary Clinton takes Nevada Democratic Caucus by six points over Bernie Sanders, a decisive victory, but Senator Sanders' momentum had cost her there. Americans are right to be angry, but we're also hungry for real solutions. We are bringing working people and young people into the political process in a way we have not seen for a very long time. So now the parties prepare to switch states. The GOP heads to Nevada this week, and the Democrats come here for their primary this week. And you can already tell Michael on the ground here because all of the people in South Carolina who have been just bombarded with political ads over the last week or so, as of midnight last night, they've switched to Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton ads, and we expect that that will be what they see all week this week. And of course, we in Florida will be seeing that pretty soon as well. Well, we will. March 15th is our primary, a winner-take-all primary. And as our guest, Ileana russ Leighton said to me a minute ago, if Jeb Bush had come here and sputtered out 
in that primary, it would have been just a terrible embarrassment. But it's an embarrassment enough for him to have ended his campaign as he did there in South Carolina. It was, you know, it was very bittersweet for Jeb Bush supporters, and you could hear when he announced there was this kind of groan and a boo. I think people were really surprised, even with his low numbers all along, that he would get out before the actual primary in a state where he has such strong support. And we've been hearing talk that this was not maybe entirely his decision. Maybe some party operatives had asked him to step down, use $100 million in super PAC money that they can use because the GOP, as you know, wants to see anyone but Donald Trump become the nominee. So that, that's a possibility. But, you know, this was a place where Jeb Bush was supposed to be resurrected. His family was here. George W. Bush, former president, is hugely popular in South Carolina. He was here. It's a it's a military family base. It's um, you know it's a faith based state. And you heard all the candidates, not just Jeb Bush, talk about in their speeches God and being blessed. You heard so much of that, and uh, it really was very disappointing to him that he never really got out of the single digits last night. And Glenna, as you talk to various political operatives there, and you certainly have over the last several days, do you get the sense that the Republican establishment is going to try to get behind Marco Rubio now? Um, I think, I, I'm not sure I can answer that at this point. I think that would be the conventional wisdom because at, at this point, you know, it's, it's so long, there's so much time to go. Primaries are a numbers game with the delegates, and, and right now that's so early in the process. So now it's all about momentum. Um, if you watch Marco Rubio, in all of his speeches, he kind of subliminally projects, when I'm president, I'm this, I'm that, and he's got such energy, and his speech is so compelling that he, um, you know, he has the attention, especially with Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, if, if it is a three-man race now, Marco Rubio would be the natural candidate that the GOP would want to get behind in this case. So, I, you know, that may be premature, but in this early stage, that could very well be. And, and also, you know, while we're talking about that, it was so interesting for us here to talk to voters and hear how all of this messaging translates with voters and why voters would choose to vote for whom they, ch they chose to vote. And consistently we heard that they were attracted to energy and electability. And the people who actually attended Jeb Bush's town halls, and there were a lot of them, less speeches, more town halls, where Jeb Bush would sit and discuss policy and detail. People who actually saw him and heard him were very taken by him and actually voted for him. Those who didn't see him up close and personal and just saw him on television consistently told us that they didn't see the energy. They didn't really feel like he wanted to be president that badly. And it was such an interesting uh, perspective to hear from voters when I guess when you're closer to it you see things much differently and and uh, you know you and I both know Jeb Bush well we've covered him as the governor and when he was the governor of Florida for eight years he was a dynamic figure larger than life uh, in Tallahassee and in the life of the state of Florida like it or not some of the things he did Terry Schiavo and so on and yet I think that Donald yeah. Trump scored some points early on when he said, Jeb, low energy. I, I think whether it was accurate or not, that label stuck, didn't it? Um, I think it did. What Jeb is, uh, Jeb was an absolutely, by all accounts, fierce leader. He is a, a leader by persona. Again, as you said, like his politics or not, there's no argument that it was his way or the highway. He was very thoughtful in his deliberations. He had has principles that he stuck with. He's a rock star leader in Florida because of his record with conservatives. He is not a rock star personality. And in this race, probably because of Donald Trump, and really when you blow it up a little bit in our society, rock stars get the attention and sometimes and, and i don't mean to suggest that this is style over substance with any of the candidates but sometimes style over substance catches the attention and wins at least in the short term right now the short term is momentum and momentum in this race could well lead to a win glenna we are so glad that you have been in south carolina and also in new hampshire and iowa come home and uh, rejoin us here on the set next week 
for this week in South Florida? Getting on the plane now. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Thank you very much. All right. Up next, the president says he's going to Cuba next month. And reaction has been negative from two of our four Cuban-American members of Congress. And we will hear from Congresswoman Ileana Ross-Layton next. Uh, the president will be going to Cuba um, with the First Lady on March 21st and 22nd. That announcement from Ben Rhodes, who is the president's point man on Cuba, really came as no surprise on Thursday. Mr. Obama has made no secret of his desire to visit the island, but he indicated in, De in December he wanted to see good progress on human rights and other areas of concern before he went. Turns out he's going to go anyway. And that certainly rankles Representative <laughs> Ileana Russ Layton, a Miami veteran Republican who serves the 27th Congressional District, which includes much of Miami. Hi, Aaliyah, Southwest Miami Dade Congresswoman. Always I'm not great. too rankled. <laughs> I'm disappointed, but well, I don't do rankle well. All right. Well, you characterize it in your own way. On Thursday, you did say it's shameful. It that is. the president would go. Why, why is it shameful that a president trying to advance a policy, one you disagree with, would go to a country and try and sit down with its leader and say, hey, you've got to do better on human rights and other things? Well, because I agree with the President Obama's statements when he said, when the conditions are right, uh, we will advance human rights. And, and all of those statements are, are positive. But what we see here, in my point of view, is just legacy shopping. Um, nuclear deal with Iran, check, visit to Cuba, check. Uh, we have seen 40 consecutive Sundays of beatings of the ladies yeah. in white. In fact, just this week, Michael, uh, when, the, when the rumor was that the president was going to announce the trip to Cuba, uh, there were almost 30 ladies in white arrested. And these are peaceful demonstrators who are just calling out for respect for human rights. And, and so what the president's announcement of December 17th of the year before to now, what have we seen? Massive exodus of Cubans right. leaving the 40, island. 43,000 have arrived at the U.S. border with Mexico. More than 8,000 Cubans have been uh, detained, harassed, jailed uh, in Cuba. We, so you've we, got we, it. We, we know and the, the record. But those are not just little talking points. I mean, this yeah. is the reality. And so the president's visit will just further cement an already cemented uh, regime in power. Mm -hmm. And the Cuban people will say, oh, well, the United States is, is reaching out and uh, to the regime, not really reaching out to the no, people. But, but he will meet with some folks, but, uh, Eliana, he, I mean, but will he meet me, with Antunes, or, the ladies or, in white, or, that's Alberta the question. Soled, a real substantive discussion. In a or, separate meeting also. Or Andres, what happened when Kerry yeah, went over there. Yeah. That was just a show. Well, all right. Uh, Andres Oppenheimer, the very fine columnist yeah. uh, for the Miami Herald syndicated columnist, he wrote an excellent column this morning in which he said, It'll be one thing if the president meets, say, at the embassy with a whole group of Cubans, intellectuals, business people, and, and a few approved dissidents. But he's got to meet with Atunas and, and uh, uh, the others. The people Berta who Soler, have been arrested. The people meet who with them separately. That's and, what needs to be done. And then somehow the Cuban people need to see that image. And I wish him luck that. that. I wish him success. And that's the image that needs to be broadcast so that the dissidents don't feel that they have been shunned <clears throat> by the greatest democracy in the world. Right. Uh, President Obama is our leader. And we want him to project a position of strength of human rights that, that we want to advance democracy right. on the island where there are no multi-party elections there are no elections at all there's right. selections there there are no uh, labor unions everything that president obama stands for yeah. as he sought the democratic nomination none of that is existence in, in but, cuba but there and we want been, him to advance that yeah, and but, i wish him the best yeah. he's going to go there's nothing i can do to stop him but if he's going to go then we want him to advance uh, American uh, values that right. we want for all people to all be right. free. Well, this is God given. I want to play a soundbite from Ben Rhodes, his deputy national security advisor, where he made the announcement. Well, we, I'm sorry, we don't have the soundbite. Anyway, Ben Rhodes said, yeah, we understand human rights is a huge issue. And the, and the president was going, is going to tell Raul Castro, your people need freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, free elections. And and I, I'm sure that at some point, the president, who knows the tone in which that conversation will take place, but 
I mean, isn't it at least positive for our president to look eye to eye with Raul Castro and say those things? It is positive to say those things, but I don't think President Obama has any illusion that Cuba is going to change under the Castros. In fact, in fact, Grandma, the official communist yeah. paper of right. Cuba where they don't have a free press. You don't have a Michael Putney this week in South Florida show there. Uh, uh, what did La they Mesa say? Redonda, La Mesa which is Redonda. All the favorite pets <laughs> right. of, the, of the Castro government sit around and So talk. their editorial um, yesterday said uh, President Obama's visit is proof that there are no human rights violations in Cuba. Well, so you already see that there's no opening. Absurd. Uh, they are not going to change. Since Secretary of State Kerry's visit to the island nation, what has happened since then? More repression, more yeah, exodus, and but, but that's not going to happen. But there, but there has been progress. I mean, we have a civil oh! issue. But, well, commercially, there's been progress. Civil aviation agreement. By the fall, there could be commercial regular flights between the United States and Cuba. There's been uh, progress on immigration, on uh, human rights, human trafficking, narcotics. I mean, there has been these talks. I mean, is that not some kind of progress? That is not any kind of progress. We don't want to... Uh, look, if there were a Starbucks on every corner and a McDonald's on the opposite side of the corner, that's not going to help the Cuban people uh, be free and have elections and have freedom of expression. Uh, there's such a difference between concessions from the U.S. side to Cuba, and we have yet to see whether Castro is going to accept any of these concessions. Yeah. It's been one-sided. President Obama has not really demanded any of those well, changes take and place, that, and Raul Castro has said they will not take place. That's the difference. Castro has already said right. we will not change, and this visit is validation that what we're doing is correct. Castro, that is how the Castro yeah, regime Castro has is interpreting has, this has, visit. Uh, there's no question. Raul has said that. I want to quote from a op-ed piece in today's New York Times. I don't know if you've seen it. Stephen Ratner, a prominent Wall Street executive and opinion writer, uh, has written this piece in the in the, today's New York Times, and it says at one point a, at the end, with so much of the economy, Cuban economy, remaining under state control, Cuba has an exceptionally long to-do list. But while our embargo didn't succeed in reforming the country, the slow, steady infiltration of capitalism just might. I disagree because... Uh, uh the capitalism in Cuba is state controlled still. Um, you know, this, this notion that there are entrepreneurs in Cuba, who gets those licenses? The regime uh, relatives, uh, pals of the regime, and we want this uh, Alice in Wonderland myth that, that these things are happening in Cuba, that Cuba is, yeah. is opening up to yeah. capitalism, yeah, but and it's not happening. People like Mike Fernandez of Coral Gables, the health insurance. I respect him insurance, greatly, yes. You know, a really a, a extraordinary guy. I agree. I mean, he and Joe Arreola and former Commerce Secretary Gutierrez and Carlos Saladrigas, all these really prominent Cuban Americans have said, we want to encourage the private sector in Cuba. They've gone there. We all there. do. They've and it's not possible set under a state-controlled uh, regime that controls the economy as well. It controls the tourist sector. And look, I'd like to go to their optometrist because I'd love to get those Rhodes <laughs> College glasses as well uh, because yeah. I don't see it. It's not happening. And uh, we, we hope that it does. And if this visit of President Obama brings about those changes, then God love him for it. Yeah. But it hasn't happened yet. And no, you've had no. murder of U.S. citizens. You've had uh, ladies in white being beaten. And the regime says we're not changing. We're going to continue right. well, the course. The so I don't know how it The president says change. he's intent. We'll talk about this I more. And I, I also want succeeds. to hear you out on Donald Trump as your party's presidential Oy nominee. Vey. I know you've got a lot to say about that. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll come back with Ileana Russ Layton in just a minute. This morning with the one and only Ileana Ross Layton and Congresswoman from the 27th Congressional District. Thank Congresswoman, you, I, I need to ask you, I asked you this question on Thursday, need to ask it again. 1972, Richard Nixon went to China. The staunch anti-communist could do that because of his record and subsequently uh, the strained relations basically ended this huge commercial relationship. And I think you'd have to admit the lives of millions of Chinese people, because the economy there has flourished kind of in a down period now, but 
the, the lives of millions of people there improved. And so what's the difference between Nixon going to China in 1972 and Barack Obama going to Cuba in 2016? A huge difference. And you mentioned Andres Oppenheimer's excellent column in today's paper. Yes. Read it to see how he differentiates between the Nixon visit to China and the Obama visit right. to, to Cuba. And I would add to his uh, thinking a few other items. Uh, Nixon went from a position of strength to try to get uh, China uh, to cooperate more with the United States. Unfortunately, what's happened after that visit and since is that China developed two models, political repression right. but economic freedom. Uh, we don't have even that differentiation in Cuba. Also, what we've seen of the Obama presidency is, uh, is a legacy of concessions. Uh, he did it with the Iran deal that has been from a, a position of weakness, not from a position of strength of, of Richard Nixon. And we got, we got something out of yeah. the visit to, to China. Uh, well, we got we a got, huge amount and, out of it. But we wanted China is not to be uh, so involved with the, in the, in the mm -hmm. Vietnamese war to uh, helping the, the North Vietnamese. And we got them to be more of a member of the community, uh, world community. In Cuba, you have, uh, uh, you have a small country that has been uh, violently anti-American that has killed American citizens. Right. When was the last time that China killed American citizens? Uh, when was the last time that we have a Tiananmen Square every Sunday? Because you have China, a huge yeah. country, well, Cuba, a small country. Say that's exactly analogous, well, but I see your but point. But it's political no, I, repression yeah. so, so openly. And what we see in Obama is an ideological visit that is in line with his uh, uh, with his philosophy right. and legacy building, and that's not what Nixon yeah, was well, doing. Well, and as Andre Oppenheimer pointed out, the difference between Saudi Arabia or Vietnam or the other uh, really yeah. autocratic regimes in the world with which we have better relations, Cuba is within our hemisphere. In our hemisphere, and, 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 and Cuba has signed on to, we're going to uh, respect human rights, etc. Yeah, something that something that the other countries have yeah. not. All right. Congresswoman, I need to ask you, Donald Trump leading the Republican ticket in November, it's now a real possibility you're going to be on that ticket. That's not going to help you, is yay, it? Yay, yay, yay. Ay, caramba. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, Carlos Corbello, uh, Mario diaz Ballard, Lincoln diaz Ballard, and I were together last night watching those returns come in, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was like a body blow every well, time, you, that and 1 percent, and, and it was. Supported Jeb for and it's many not years. a surprise uh, that that he has bowed out because it was a tough, tough road. Dexter and I went to New Hampshire, went to town halls with uh, with Jeb. He was doing so well, becoming a better candidate. Uh, Keith Fernandez, my legal counsel, is there in South Carolina, yeah. so we saw this just not happening for Jeb. And we've got the Donald Trump uh, explosion, which is personality over policy. Jeb would give detailed answers to the student loan crisis. Too detailed, and, though. To, and, and was not connecting with the voters as he yeah. should. He was ready from day one to be president. Uh, I was proud to support him. Uh, Mario Lincoln and I uh, and Carlos are going to be uh, together tomorrow at 1.30. We're going to announce what our next step is for the presidential uh, election. And uh, uh, we were I, proud to be with can, Jeb. Can you give and, us a little preview? I've got a feeling that you could be a lot more at home with Marco Rubio than I think uh, we Ted can. Cruz. I think we can. You know, we, we know and love Marco. And I've, we've never said one negative word yeah. about, about Marco. But we will see. We're, we're talking to the we, candidates we, as we, we speak. <laughs> We will be there to cover whatever you have to say. Uh, it's always a delight to speak with you. Thank, Thank you, you very Michael much. Putney. Okay. Mi amigo. Si, mi amiga. Si, claro que si. <laughs> all right. After the break, we're going to take it all to the round table, and we have an all star panel for you today. Where do you meet them? It is time now to take a much closer and a more analytical look at the week's top news stories and some add opinion into the mix as well. And we do that with our powerhouse roundtable. Here they are with a lineup. Katie Fang, Miami attorney, partner in the Berger Singerman Law Firm, a former prosecutor in both Miami-Dade and Broward. Mark Caputo is a roundtable regular, the Florida correspondent for Politico, the website for all things political. He also writes the Politico Daily Playbook, which is a must read. And we are glad to welcome back Dr. Jorge Duane, director of the Cuba Research Institute 
at Florida International University, professor of anthropology. Gee, I thought Governor Scott said there shouldn't be anthropologists <laughs> anymore. Everybody should be a STEM student. Anyway, good to see you very Thank much, you. Jorge, for coming in. Mark, let me turn to you first. Uh, is it now inevitable, or is Donald Trump close to becoming the Republican presidential nominee. If you made me bet, I would say Donald Trump is going to be the nominee. He leads well in delegates, and he has a really good or propitious calendar that he's facing, these SEC primary states, so to speak, right. in the southeast, lean heavily Trump. And uh, then, then he's going to be heading into Florida on March 15th, and he's doing well here in the polls. Uh, Katie Fang, uh, you follow politics closely. I, I just have to say, uh, I, I listen to Donald Trump this week, I saw him on the CNN uh, town hall forum, <laughs> and uh, he says things that are, frankly, inappropriate yep. that would, for any other politician, be death. I mean, to, in South Carolina, to criticize George W. Bush, say he caused the, the war. Uh, he called him a liar. He didn't just criticize him, him. He called him a liar. So. Right. Yeah. How, how does he survive and say all these things? He says incredibly socially and politically unacceptable things, and yet the terrifying component is people are saying he's saying things that we're all thinking. I find that to be particularly offensive because it's not what I think. But it's the idea that there's the millions of voters out there that feel disenfranchised by the current administration, and they're looking for a change to, I guess, borrow a former Obama phrase. They want change. They think Trump is it. But I, Mark and I were talking about this before we got here for the roundtable. Trump's got a way to go. I mean, he's got to get the number of delegates to be able to be our nominee for the party, and I don't know if he's right. going to do it. Well, there is a kind of a mechanical aspect. Yep. I mean, you've got to collect all these delegates, and uh, but he's got a very strong campaign. Uh, Jorge, I have to ask you, I mean, uh, you're an academic, but you <laughs> follow the political world. When you watch all the, what happened this week in South Carolina, what do you think? Well, I think there's a polarizing trend. I mean, uh, over the campaign, we've seen more and more white voters and evangelical voters, especially voting for Trump. Uh, but the other uh, groups have really have uh, fallen out of the way. So, for instance, I think one of the issues will be when when the campaign comes to, to Florida, how are Hispanics uh, going to vote? Uh, well, for, they're not going to vote the for uh, that's the thing. Donald so, Trump, are they? I mean, the guy who said we have to build the wall and the border. I I, I think that Hispanics. Are, are just going to say no, we're oh, not going to vote I, that way. I, I'll tell you, I, I spoke to a lot of Florida House members and, and Florida State Senators who had endorsed Jeb Bush. Mm -hmm. And I asked them when I was up in Tallahassee, you, who are you endorsing? Jeb Bush. Uh, if the election were today, how would the Republicans in your district vote? They said Donald Trump. And those are, if you're a Republican from South Florida, you're generally Cuban American and you're, right. you have a sizable Cuban American population. You're going to forget Marco Rubio though from this mix? <laughs> that's, that's what's amazing though, is that they were saying, wow. Trump, my next door neighbor is a Cuban American. He fled Cuba as a kid. Uh, he likes Trump. The only thing that took the shine off of Trump for him was Trump's statements on Planned Parenthood. He thinks Trump might be a little too far left. But don't count Trump out, at least in a Republican primary. Well, what about Ted Cruz? I was watching last night, uh, you know, here's the fourth place finisher making a victory speech. They all made, <laughs> they all made victory, <laughs> victory speeches. speeches last night. And, and Katie, I, I've got to say there is something about Ted Cruz that is so off-putting. Uh, it, there is something self-pitying about the way he presents himself. Last night, here we see him uh, making this speech, and maybe we should run the soundbite, but he said, they said I couldn't win in Iowa. They said I couldn't win in New Hampshire. They said I couldn't win in South Carolina. And I won. If, I, if I'm not the nominee, uh, the Second Amendment will go away. I, 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 I just, I listen to this and I kind of think to myself, where's this guy coming from? He has to justify his poor performance in South Carolina, which typically would have been the evangelical vote. He right. thought he was going to corner the market in yeah, an incredibly conservative state. Votes. And so Trump brought in the evangelical voters, and so Cruz had to figure yeah. out a way of saying, don't count me out yet, I'm still in the mix, but really, again, it's the delegate votes. Cruz has got some. He's got, you know, pretty much uh, dead heat with Rubio, but Trump's so far ahead. But, you know, Cruz has to maintain his relevancy. They all do. And people like John Kasich, he's going to be out soon because he's not going to be relevant. Right. And pretty much we're terrifyingly going to be left with three candidates in the end. Well, so is it a three-man race right now? Not yet. If Kasich doesn't get out and, it, and the March 1st primaries break, tr uh, break Trump in the southeast, the next two states up are Ohio and Florida. And those are two states that... Rubio needs to win, especially Florida, but also Ohio, because it's got 66 and 99 delegates. And that's John Kasich's home and, state exactly. right there in Ohio. Exactly. If Kasich doesn't get out in Ohio, 
the chance of Rubio winning that are pretty slim. And right now the polling shows the chance of Trump winning Ohio are pretty high. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look good for folks who don't want Trump as the nominee. Maybe we should pull the Pope and ask him whether or not he thinks <laughs> that Trump's going to win. Well, how, how, how does somebody, I mean, this immensely popular Pope, uh, Francis, and Jorge, he gets into this a spat where the Pope says on his plane going back to uh, to Rome that somebody who wants to build a wall instead of bridges is not really a good Christian. And then Trump fires back uh, and survives it. And again, I think that's another divisive issue, the whole issue of immigration, of course, which uh, Trump has led the way in terms of uh, controlling the borders and so on. The Catholic Church in particular and Hispanics uh, more generally have supported some kind of immigration reform and right. that's not going to happen anytime under Trump's administration. Right. And, and what, uh, I'm sorry, Mark. Well, what, what? make no mistake, South Carolina is evangelical. They are Protestants. They protested against the Pope. Right. Bashing the Pope is not bad politics in, in when you South have a bunch Carolina. of Protestant voters. That's right. I saw that only 13% of voters uh, in the primary, I think, are Catholic. So well, what about the Catholics down in Florida, though? Yeah. Well, it'll There's make a whole bunch of Catholics here. in Florida. I mean, and very few Hispanics Pope in South Carolina as well. Yeah. Before, we, yeah, and before we wrap up this uh, aspect of uh, of the roundtable, I've got to ask you, Mark. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton won by five points in uh, Nevada in the caucuses. That was just a must win. She had been ahead by their 25, 30 points at one point. But it's a win is a win, and it's a pretty solid win. It is, and the exit polls are a little confused. It does seem she won the Hispanic vote. It seems she won the black vote big. If that trend holds everywhere else, bye-bye Bernie Sanders. Right, right. So, boy, just think about that. <laughs> Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Boy, I Whoa. can't. The I burn can't will be cooled <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> okay, stay with us. We'll be back with uh, more talk here on the round table in just a minute. We are in the midst of the round table. Mark Caputo from Politico, Katie Fang, famed attorney, and Jorge Duane from FIU, famed in my mind anyway. Uh, Jorge, let me ask you about the president's trip to Cuba. Um, he had said, as Ileana had said earlier, uh, that in December he wanted to see progress on human rights before he went, but there's really not been any progress. So is this, uh, a, you know, is he caving in to the Castros by going? Why is he going now? Well, I think for him it's important to make this an irreversible policy change so that the next president, the next Congress can't uh, go back mm -hmm. uh, before December 17, 2014. So it, it really is part of his agenda mm -hmm. to make it so difficult for the next uh, president, the, the next White House, to reverse the, the rapprochement with Cuba. Right. So the, the progress, I mean, Ileana ross Leighton said it wasn't progress, but I mean, Katie, we've got commercial flights that are going to begin, Carnival Cruise Lines wants to send a, a cruise ship down there this summer. Uh, beginning this summer, there is agreement on narcotics and human trafficking. Uh, there has been some movement, even though there hasn't been movement on human rights. There's been the capitalism that you and Ileana spoke yes. about before we took to the round table. But the question I have is for the president, is it going to be a carefully curated group of dissidents with yeah. whom he's going to be meeting? Are you joking? You think that the Castro regime is going to allow him to go to the jail and ask the people in the jail what they think about how civil rights has progressed in the country? Right. It is absurd. And I am all for normalization of relations with countries because I do believe believe that it does make forward progress for both nations, but why why not ask for more before you go? Why not demand more before you go? Right. Or is this yeah. just a swan song right. yeah. event on well, Obama's part? I, I think you make an excellent point, and later in a little commentary at the end, I'm going to say a condition of him going should be appearing on Cuban state TV to oh. speak directly to the Cuban people. I mean, he could have demanded that, couldn't he, Jorge? I think, I think he might uh, actually be, be going in that direction. President Carter did it when he yes, went he uh, a couple of times before. And I think, as we speak, there must be some uh, very uh, strong negotiation going well, on. I hope. And what will probably happen, I think, in terms of the dissidents will be that they will meet separately at the ambassador's house in Havana, mm -hmm. just like they did with uh, Secretary Terry when he went over right. the embassy. Well, right. An interesting thing about Cuba policy and the presidential election is not only do Sanders and Clinton support Obama's rapprochement with Cuba, but so does Donald Trump, yes. who has kind of completely <laughs> reversed himself. Uh, when he, before he ran for, decided to maybe run for office in 2000, he was a hardliner like them all. 
And now he's basically saying, well, yeah, it's time to move on. It's time to change. Remember, he's also a casino well, developer. He's also an uber capitalist. So hello, and he's a right? casino developer. Yeah, you know, you know so he, open up Meyer Lansky's old casino. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Uh, I want to move on to uh, another big story. And Katie, I know that you have thought a lot about that, and that is the death of Antonin Scalia yeah. and naming a successor. The president says he will do it in due time. Yes. Uh, what what does that time. mean? Uh, whatever that means for Obama. A in week due time. or two? Or? There's no set time frame within which he's going to make this decision, but we all know and we can all anticipate a filibuster to occur when and if the, the nomination process right. happens. The thing that troubles me is that um, Obama can plan this trip to Cuba, which is uh, particularly involved international travel, but he can't go down the street to Antonin Scalia's funeral yesterday. He sent Joe Biden and his wife, uh, Mrs. Biden, in his stead. I, I think it was a sign of, of disrespect. Um, Scalia was the longest serving justice on the highest court of our land, and everybody needs to know it's not just lawyers that are affected by these decisions, right. it's everyone who lives in the United States. So why not show some respect and actually go and pay your respects uh, to Scalia? A good point. And did you say, Mark, that you thought that maybe the Scalia family had said, indicated... This is the problem with, this is the problem with reading too much, especially <laughs> on social media. I say, allegedly, I'd come across somewhere, and who knows, it could have been just some phony troll lying. But uh, there, there, there is word among liberals uh, who are saying, no, it's not that Obama intentionally snubbed Scalia's family. Word was sent that he, his presence, Obama's presence, would, would not be... Uh, looked on favorably at the funeral. Don't yeah. know if that's true, All right, well, but it, if there's any pushback, it's that. Yeah. But, you know, getting a straight answer out of the White House or anyone these days in politics no, is it's, almost it's almost, it, it is almost impossible. Uh, Jorge, the, um, uh, the strategy, it appears, from the White House, uh, they're considering is either appoint a moderate Republican to the court or nominate, uh, like Governor Sandoval of Nevada, who is a Republican, but you know, kind of a middle centrist uh, Republican, uh, former attorney general, former president, former federal judge. And then what, what do the Republicans on the Judici Judici Judiciary Committee do when you get a nomination like that? Yeah. How do you reject it? I'm not an expert on the topic. What I, what I have heard is that the Republicans are actually waiting to see who's going to be nominated and then develop their strategy, yeah. whether they're going to prove it or not, because they don't want to be, see, be seen as obstructing whatever process may take place. Well, never held him back before. Uh, you know, remember, on the, basically the day after Scalia was dead, Mitch McConnell was already promising to block yeah. whichever nominee it was. I, maybe Obama will decide to nominate a... Uh, a Republican, a moderate Republican, but you know Democrats have had enough of Democrats trying to be like Republicans. That would be atrociously unpopular in the Democratic primary. Right. In the which is race. which is why I personally think somebody like Loretta Lynch, the Attorney General, who's African American, Harvard Law School graduate, former U.S. Attorney, uh, I think that the uh, rejection of her nomination probably would stimulate Democrats in the November election. Well, these are lifetime appointments. I mean, technically, according to the Constitution, it's for good behavior, and that's <laughs> literally how it's defined, but they're lifetime appointments. And so it's a yeah. serious idea, a nomination, and the process yeah. has to be well vetted. And, you yeah. know, again, it's, it affects all of us. In the brief time we have left, Jorge Duane, I don't know about you, but I've got an iPhone. Uh, I would not like the government to be able to hack into it at will if they suspected me of doing something wrong. But the government says the, the iPhone owned by the San Bernardino killer, that's the only one they want Apple to open up. So why Yeah, and should? of course, it's a, it's a broader legal issue yeah. that I'm sure you're going to be calling to on. Uh, so the, the, the question is whether this will threaten further uh, civil liberties and the right, right. to privacy right as to opposed privacy. to the right of the government to pursue uh, uh, terrorists. Right. Katie, where do you stand on this? It's an unenviable position to be on either side of this. I am all for making sure that we combat domestic terrorism. And, and there's an interesting statement that was made today by the New York PD Deputy Commissioner. This is a dead man. He has no expectation of privacy in right. his iPhone. So if you're committing domestic terrorism on our soil, and if we have the ability to access the information to find out with whom you may have been conspiring to be able to protect the rest of us, I think I it's think important to have this information. There should interest. be an app for that, really. <laughs> all right, that's the, that's find the final Find that terrorist. Word. Click I, on the I, app. I, I like it. All right, Mark and Katie. 
Uh, Jorge, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate Always. it. Thank Always you. fun. All right, still to come, my personal perspective about President Obama and what he might be able to accomplish in Cuba. Here now is a live look from our Miami Tower cam. Oh, it looks beautiful out there, but let's uh, go to a little beautiful meteorologist, Jennifer Correa. <laughs> with your Sunday forecast. Jennifer, hello. Oh, thank you, Michael. You're going to make me blush, blush live on TV. Uh, I'm doing very well. I hope you're doing awesome in South Florida. I hope you're enjoying the sunshine. Get out there, whether you're going to the beach or not. Just head outside. It's absolutely gorgeous. By the way, high rip current risk is still in effect, so do be careful if you're out at the beach. And, of course, with all that sunshine, use that sunscreen. Already at 79 degrees in Pembroke Pines, winds out of the east, anywhere between 10 to up to 15 miles per hour currently. Uh, winds should stay around 10. 10 if you're out at the beach with a surf of one to two feet. Boaters, no advisories, but just be careful in the bays. The bays with a moderate drop seas, two to four feet and occasionally up to five. Now, after all this sunshine for the end of this weekend, we are going to see a few changes this upcoming week. Starting tomorrow, a little more cloud cover, better chance for showers Tuesday, especially Wednesday when that cold front arrives. And after the cold front, we start to cool things down. By the end of the week, we're talking the 50s, and we'll be using our sweaters by then. Michael? Jennifer, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about the president's upcoming trip to Cuba. I've said it before, I'll say it again, I don't think it's a good idea for the president to visit Cuba until the Castro government has made significant improvements in human rights. Mr. Obama says, yes, he will bring up human rights concerns when he sits down with Raul Castro. I'm sure Castro will nod and say, yes, we understand you've got concerns. So do we about all those unarmed black men who have been shot to death by police in the U.S. We have concerns, too, about the plight of millions of poor people in the U.S. who struggle to get by. Of course, most people in Cuba are poor. The average salary there is $25 a month. As the old joke goes, the revolution has been great except for three things, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There's nothing funny, of course, about the lack of basic human rights in Cuba, the ability of people to freely elect their leaders, to assemble without harassment, to speak out and demand change. And here is hoping the president directly tells Raul Castro that must change and to withhold U.S. benefits until it does. The most important thing the president could do, I think, in Cuba is to meet with a group of pro-democracy activists, real activists, the people who are regularly harassed, beaten, detained, and jailed. And there has to be a way for that meeting to be seen by the Cuban people. We don't know if Cuban State TV is going to give Mr. Obama airtime. I think he should demand it as a condition for his trip. He needs to explain directly to the Cuban people what his policy goals are. They need to know the U.S. goal is to create a successful civil society that does not need the Cuban government to exist, a society that will prosper. Let's not be naive about Mr. Obama's visit. Three popes have gone to Cuba in the last two decades, and the government is still autocratic and repressive. President Obama could change things for the better, but he has to stop giving concessions to the Castro government without getting anything in return. This new relationship has been a one-way street so far. That's my perspective. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We like to know what you think, invite you to weigh in on any topic, email us, send us a tweet at any one of these addresses. We're easy to find. We will respond. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next week.